Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jennifer Roberts, and I am the former faculty director for the arts here at the Radcliffe Institute. It's a great honor to welcome you to the opening of Tamashi Jackson's exhibition here at Radcliffe. This exhibition has been a very long time coming. It was over three years ago that we first approached Tamashi to invite her to do a show here. And it was over 18 months ago that the show was supposed to open. We are thrilled then to be reawakening our gallery with this particular exhibition. Tamashi's work exemplifies the highest goals of the arts program at the Radcliffe Institute. Her work teaches us what it means to commit to art as a form of advanced study and engagement. It also teaches us what it means for art to be entwined with other disciplines. As you'll see this evening, she reveals unexpected connections between the languages of the visual arts and the languages of law, urbanism, and social justice. In this exhibition, she focuses on the history and legacy of school desegregation in the United States, particularly in Boston. Now, this evening's program is very special. Tamashi will be in conversation with Tamiko Brown Nagin, who is a prominent scholar of constitutional law and also, incidentally, our own dean of the Radcliffe Institute. Tamiko and Tamashi will speak for about 30 minutes. Their conversation will be followed by a brief slideshow of images from the exhibition and then the audience Q&A. We encourage audience members to submit questions through the Zoom Q&A feature at any time during the program, and we will get to as many of those as we can. The exhibition, of course, is now open to visit in person, and I encourage everyone in the area to do so. It does require a very simple pre-registration process, which has a link on the exhibition webpage, uh, and that link will be in the chat during the program. Harvard ID holders are welcome in September, and then the space will open to the full public after October 1st. Now at the exhibition, you can also pick up a free copy of the publication that goes along with the show. And I wanna emphasize that this is not just a kind of side brochure. This is an important work of experimental research and a resource for future art historians as well as legal scholars. Now, this introduction is a little bit bittersweet for me because during this long pandemic delay, my term as faculty director for the arts and curator of this exhibition came to an end. I wanna thank Meg Rotzel, Curator of Exhibitions at the Radcliffe for taking over the project so expertly. Also a special thanks to the Harvard graduate students who worked with such passion and dedication on the research team for this exhibition and publication. Kayla Jackson, Kay Anthony Jones, Martha Schnee and Rachel Vogel. I also wanna take a moment to acknowledge the members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and our annual donors who are watching this afternoon. Your generosity keeps Radcliffe programming free and open to the public, and we thank you. And now to introduce our conversants. Tamashi Jackson was born in Houston and lives and works here in Cambridge and in New York City. Her work is in prominent public collections throughout the US, including the Whitney Museum of Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Baltimore Museum of Art, and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. She was included in the 2019 Whitney Biennial, and she has been, Suffice it to say, very busy lately. At this very moment, along with this solo exhibition at Radcliffe, she has work featured in a major group show at the Guggenheim Museum and another major solo exhibition at the Parish Art Museum. Tamiko Brown Nagin is Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, the Daniel P.S. Paul Professor of Constitutional Law at Harvard Law School and Professor of History at Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. In 2019, she was appointed chair of the Presidential Committee on Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery, which is anchored here at the Radcliffe. It is now my very great pleasure to pass the virtual floor to Dean Tamiko Brown Nagin. Thank you. Thank you to Jennifer and to Tamashi for being with us today. I'm so excited to have this conversation. And Tamashi, I'm going to start with a question about your interest in Brown versus Board of Education, which of course is really two cases. There's a 1954 case where the US Supreme Court holds state mandated school segregation unconstitutional. And then there is Brown II, which is the 1955 case where the court says that it's school desegregation mandate will be implemented with all deliberate speed. Now, with all deliberate speed is really an infamous phrase. 
Thurgood Marshall of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, who had litigated the case and won the victory in Brown, said that really all it meant was slow. And so, uh, Tamashi, I want you to pick up there and tell us about why now for the second time you're focused on Brown versus Ford ed education. How did you arrive at uh, that subject for your art? Thank you, Dean Tomiko. Um, it's such a treat to be in conversation with you um, and to be uh, presenting at the Radcliffe. And I wanna thank my gallerists at Tilton Gallery in New York and my gallerists at um, Night Gallery in Los Angeles. And right now I wanna thank my landlady um, who's <laughs> a Harvard family member uh, who allowed me to come and log in from her home when there was a complete Wi-Fi fail on my end. <laughs> So um, I love my Cambridge community and I'm really happy to be showing down the street from where we are right now. Um, so yes, yeah, speaking of where we are right now, it was here in uh, Massachusetts in 2014 when I was following around my best friend uh, who was then the vice chair of the education committee for the NAACP Boston branch um, as she was working to organize with others in coalition to save what remained of yellow school bus service for BPS students. And um, so I, I, I followed her around, I video recorded, I, I took uh, photographs. Um, I was present at a number of hearings at City Hall that were, uh, uh, what is, they were convened by then city councilors Tito Jackson and uh, Ayanna Presley. And um, uh, I realized how little I knew, how little I know about uh, this landmark web of cases that, um, well, they transformed and impacted all of public spaces. I'd understood it since my birth in 1980. Um, I didn't recognize, I didn't realize as a, as a child in Los Angeles, took the school bus to the USC campus to go to my performing visual arts magnet school that all of us were beneficiaries of a, um, a hard fought battle for educational access. Um, so when I was in City Hall in Boston, listening to parents from Charlestown talk about how their daughters, one woman in particular talked about how her daughter had been accepted to Boston Latin School and she accepted the offer, um, she accepted the invitation understanding that her daughter would be would have safe passage to and from school from Charlestown. Um, and only two months before the school semester was to begin, she was finding out that school bus service was uh, scheduled to be chopped from the budget. And um, yeah, I came home uh, really dismayed. And Nia had pulled out all of her binders of uh, information from her time at Columbia Teachers College, um, during which time they were celebrating the Brown decision. And she helped me understand that what I was seeing was not something that had, that was something that had little to do with each of these children personally, had more to do with a generational um, goal to unravel and roll back the gains made by that landmark legislation, that public, that public space changing legislation. So when I got to Yale to study painting and printmaking, I, um, I, I, bunkered, I hunkered down in the law library started reading the transcripts um, and trying to visualize them. So when uh, Meg and Jennifer came and saw me at Lesley University after a talk and um, invited me uh, to show at the Radcliffe, I thought, well, this is great. I get to come home to my East Coast home. I get to uh, jump back into the um, archives and I get to um, go back to this, uh, to this case, uh, to all of these, this, this um, garden of casework that I still don't really understand. Um, uh, that I still don't really understand because it's so uh, it's so huge and it changed so much. A lot of the work that I made when I was after I came out of Yale, I had a solo show that was focused on uh, visualizing that that not only visualizing that casework, but really it opened up the door into a conceptual space for me to explore um, the perception of color and its impact on the on the value of human life in public space with a focus on the lives of black children. So I focused on that for a while and then I started going to other places uh, with invitations to make work and focus on what was happening in other in other cities. So the invitation to come back to Cambridge and to have and to and to reunite with Harvard 
um, and the Harvard archives uh, seemed like an opportunity for me to focus on Brown II, which was another case that I didn't know anything about that I didn't know existed, the 1955 implementation case. Uh, what did it mean that even after the Supreme Court uh, unanimously decided that all, all of us should have access to education, what did it mean that a year later it still wasn't happening? So I came back here to figure that out. Excellent, Tamashi, thanks so much for that answer. Now, you mentioned the archives, and I know that your, your way of working is research intensive. So let's talk about the Schlesinger Library. Um, the library contains the papers of both Polly Murray and Ruth Batson, who are women who are central to your work and to this exhibition, and for, purposes of, of audience members who may not know um, these two women. Uh, Polly Murray, who is a, uh, was a civil rights lawyer who helped to craft the legal theory that the NAACP relied on during the 1950s to win Brown. And then 10, 20 years later comes Ruth Batson, who is a native of Roxbury. She is a civil rights activist and she was a leader in the struggle to, yes, to desegregate uh, the Boston schools. So the question, Tamashi, is what was it about the lives of these women that compelled you to visualize their stories and their legacies through art? Mm, I mean, they they were and are uh, keys to this, um, to, to this history, to what happened. Uh, Dean Tomiko, you know I wanna kick all of these balls back into your court because <laughs> <laughs> you're the historian that I came back here to hang out with. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm still learning. So, um, you know, much like, uh, again, um, I, all, all of these, there were just all of these, uh, these uh, historic collapses that were happening, these, these, these intertwinings that were happening, I found. And um, I was hanging around a lot with, again, my best friend who was doing a whole lot of work with the NAACP Boston branch after the uh, acquittal of George Zimmerman um, and his murder of Trayvon Martin. A lot of people, um, a lot of people felt compelled to, um, to, to, to do, a, a something with um, the sickening pain that was left behind uh, with yet another uh, killing of a, a, a black child without um, any consequences um, for the murderers. And for, for Nia, it was to get involved uh, here with this historic Boston branch, which is the first branch of the NAACP uh, in the country. Um, and that's where Ruth Batson had been the chair of the education committee. So I kept finding myself kind of like in this um, uh, sometimes interesting, sometimes compelling, sometimes uh, sickening uh, uh, whirlwind of history, um, uh, particularly around the extraordinary level of violence that uh, was being met um, by, um, uh, that, that children were being met with um, at the hands of vigilantes or uh, law enforcement officers without, without um, without accountability. And so, uh, you know, uh, when I listened to those, uh, to, to people testifying in those hearings and when I testified myself, um, I, I, I just thought like, boy, this sounds like, this sounds like some, this sounds like stories from like the forties or something. Like this sounds like things that our elders told us about um, having to travel 50 miles to get to the school that they're supposed to go to. People were talking about that, talking like that, speaking like that here and what was then contemporary greater Boston in 2014. So, um, uh, you know, to, to only learn about Polly Murray in my thirties <laughs> when I'm in graduate school um, and to, to, you know, to learn that it, it was, it was, uh, it was Polly who coined the term uh, separate but equal is inherently unequal. It was Polly who, who, uh, who thought deeply and coined uh, uh, the, the term Jane Crow. Uh, Polly studied with Spotswood Robinson, who was one of the, um, you know, I relied a lot upon the uh, the photographic archives of the NAACP um, uh, during that time. Uh, the photographs of the attorneys and also the sociological photographs that they used to make their case. Um, and yeah, just that 
looked it up, these images of these intrepid, heroic looking attorneys. And lo and behold, they are facilitating coursework at Howard Law and their poly is, um, you know, uh, her, uh, their student work, uh, influencing all of this that would happen later and impact my life and everyone else's. So um, the fact that, uh, that, the, that the papers of both of these people are kept at the Schlesinger Library on the History of Women in America, the only library of its kind anywhere. Um, I mean, if that's not a treasure trove, I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. um, and luckily, uh, Martha Schnee, who was studying education at the time uh, here at Harvard, um, uh, was very familiar with uh, the, the, the library and the librarians and organized us, the rest of the team, to go there and to, and to touch. And we, before, before uh, we went into complete COVID lockdown, the last thing I remember is spending an afternoon in that archive with Martha and uh, touching um, uh, Ruth's pictures. And the pictures, uh, the pictures from, from that collection, well, they just weren't, they weren't, they were not the images that uh, many of us associate with school desegregation in uh, Boston um, in 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, there was no violence. We looked at a lot of other um, archives. We, we dug through the WGBH archives, the Northeastern archives. We did a lot of work before we had to go into lockdown. But her archives, there were images of, um, what were they called? Um, uh, potlucks, gatherings, community organization, community organizing, picture, like the way that I see you right now, Dean Bernagan, pictures like that, where she's like, you know, sitting uh, in her office doing work, um, holding children, uh, early, early pictures from, from her, her high school years, uh, sitting in a field of grass. Um, and, and Martha and I really looked, we looked at each other and we were like, oh, wow, this is really going to, this is charging us to reconsider what we think we know about how this history should look. Wonderful. So thank you for, for those remarks, Tamashi. It certainly sounds like Ruth and Polly were both, um, they, they resonated with you in a, a very personal way. And I want to pick up uh, for this next question on the thoughts that you were sharing about the historical continuum. So you're reflecting on events that happened in the 40s and 50s and then going to the 60s, 70s, 80s, all the way up to 2014 when you had this experience in Boston. And that reminds me uh, as a civil rights historian of the phrase, the long civil rights movement, which is essentially the concept that social change occurs along an historical continuum instead of in a singular triumphant moment like 1954 and Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and so it's terrific uh, that you have managed uh, to express that concept through your work and also join the past to the present. Um, let's talk about your creative process. How do you visualize all of these complex uh, and long connections? Um, well, I'm reliant upon uh, the archival material. I'm, re I'm reliant upon the images that I have access to. Um, and I also get cues from the world around me. Um, like for instance, when I was an ARC Athens fellow in Athens, Greece, um, I got cues for what my next steps would be when I learned that all of the marble that um, has, has created and, and uh, is used to restore the, um, sacred, the sacred ancient monuments um, in Greece uh, that our own monuments of democracy are modeled after. When I learned that all of that marble comes from the same mountain and the same quarry, then I had like this aha moment <laughs> in the Parthenon complex. I was like, ah, I need to go to that quarry. I need that, I, I need that material. I need, I need to embed that into surfaces. That's what needs to happen now, you know? So, um, so it just happens like that. So like there's, there's a, there are like revelations that, that, that come um, if, I, if I'm able to be um, focused enough and I think sensitive enough. Because I don't, I, a lot of times I don't know what to do. And as a student um, at uh, MIT and Harvard um, in grad, my first go around in grad school, I kind of got more comfortable 
with um, following uh, lines of research and not always knowing what the outcome of the project was going to be. Like sometimes it might be drawing, sometimes it might be uh, other other forms of public engagement. In our case, it ended up being a publication when I wanted to make a show. <laughs> I wanted to make a show on time, you know, like I didn't, I didn't want the world to be, you know, thrust into um, a global pandemic. Um, but, you know, the circumstances showed us uh, a new way, a, a different way. It should, I shouldn't say new because none of this is new. It's they, the, the circumstances can show me and the people that I get to work with um, other ways beyond what may, perhaps what we presumed we thought we knew we were going to do. Um, other ways to create access to the material. And that was our big question, you know, how do we create access to exhibition material when it's not safe for us to gather in groups? And uh, K. Anthony Jones offered this Hal Fosterism, what is our archival impulse? You know, is our, is our intention to uh, reproduce images of violence, to, you know, re-trigger uh, the trauma that comes when we see people throwing rocks at little children in buses or setting buses on fire or, um, uh, you know, gathered, uh, gathered in, 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 in big rallies, uh, uh, insisting that, uh, it's, uh, that, that they should have the, the right to, um, to withhold resources from little growing children and other families. You know, like we actually rethought everything, including what, what I would be working with to recreate the imagery of this time. And so I ended up focusing on these jewels um, in the Schlesinger Library that um, were seen and touched and produced and cared for by these two history makers that so many of us know so little about. Mm, thank you. So uh, Tamashi, I wanna pick up there. You're, you're talking about the way in which COVID, uh, the, the shutdown interrupted your approach, which we have said is research intensive. Um, and, and what you're getting at there is that as it turned out, the disruption was generative uh, of new ways of knowing and connecting. And you created this wonderful uh, publication that includes interviews and photos, and uh, it is amazing. And it is in itself a wonderful resource about Brown too. And I, I want you to talk a little bit more about how you adapted your methodology to the COVID era and how you brought people together? Well, I gotta say, um, we were brought together by the Radcliffe Institute. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was working, gosh, I was on a nonstop schedule before I came home to my East Coast home uh, uh, in January, 2020. And uh, while I was out, <laughs> uh, Jennifer and Meg and uh, multiple other Radcliffe Jennifers um, and Sean, um, uh, they were all uh, working together to find the right people for me to work with, people who wanted to work on this project. I've never, before this, I'd never had the opportunity to work with a team that I was responsible for um, in coordinating or facilitating or engaging in uh, research. I, I normally would be running around from library to library doing it myself. And um, so that was, uh, that I had, a, there was a learning curve for me. Like I'm used to being a, I facilitate spaces at the college level for undergrads and graduates uh, in, you know, art classes, but um, uh, working with other people who were, who were here as professional students doing their own research. Um, and learning from my best friend still, watching the way she worked with her team at the Buffalo Ujima project. I just, I remember really spending a lot of time thinking about how this project could be of use to them. Like how, like what, what were they actually, what were they excited about? What did they want to do? Um, uh, as opposed to me, like directing them to go do stuff for me. Mm -hmm. um, and when we went into shutdown, it prompted us all to have, I had these one-on-one -on -one conversations with them and before we regathered as a group and I just asked each one of them, do you even want to do this? Like, do you want to keep going? Do you, or, you know, do you want to stop? Because everything else stopped. In the end, we were the only Radcliffe project that continued to grow and work to completion during the shutdown, which is amazing. And I'm, I'm like, uh, you know, it's historic actually um, that, you know, the, the, it's the first time the campus was evacuated since 1775. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
yeah, we were able to continue forward um, in a way that I felt was appropriately nurturing of each of the people who chose to stay on the project. Mm -hmm. um, Kayla Jackson created a playlist for the show because she was listening to, uh, she was, I remember her telling me she was trying to resist the compulsion to doom scroll on her phone and instead was staying up late uh, watching and listening um, free DJ sets from DJ D Nice, Club Quarantine. Early at the, at the top of the quarantine, he started DJing from his home and broadcasting live on IG. So she created a music playlist for us. Martha Schnee um, is an educator and an artist in her own right. And I noticed that she would make doodles and drawings when we would meet with people. So I uh, worked with the Radcliffe team to send her uh, supplies so that she could enlarge her drawings um, from, you know, like to really consider them not as doodles, but as uh, keys, um, another key component to our research process. And then of course, Kansney just held us all together. So um, yeah, I mean, that's the way it worked for us. Uh, and, in, and in the end, I, you know, the ahas that kept coming, kind of like that aha that happened at the Parthenon, um, there was this moment where I was like, oh, wow, no, wow, okay. So we started off digging into these archives and now we are creating extensions of those archives. And, and the work that we are doing now by animating the um, conversations that we're having with people, the, the advocates who were there, the, uh, the, uh, the civil rights attorneys who worked with the LDF after all of this happened, um, the people who were technologists and humanists who were exploring what it means to be human and surveilled today. Um, uh, we are, we are in, we are, we're making recordings that are video recordings. We have audio archive. We have a collection of our, uh, interview preparatory documents with, which your office made sure that we sent two weeks ahead of time. <laughs> so we have these, we have this, we have a, co a collection of multiple aspects of archive that arose from our just being consistent in developing this process, including drawings and the uh, the transcribed excerpts themselves. And so it, it, yeah, I'm really proud of it actually. Well, I am really proud of it too, Tamashi. And it is not surprising to, to me knowing how wonderful our, our staff is at the Radcliffe Institute that you got such good care um, during that really challenging period. And, you know, the arts program is such a, so, so important to what we do. At, at Radcliffe and it, it's wonderful to hear that part of your reflection. And I will also say, you know, we, we talked during that period mm -hmm. and I was so impressed with how thoughtful and respectful you were of the students who were working with you. It, it, was, it, was, uh, it was quite something. And uh, I'm just so happy that uh, despite the challenges of COVID, um, this, this wonderful, artwork and community has come out of it. Now, I wanna ask you another question, Tamashi, um, which is about some of the interviews in this publication. Um, a number of them focus on technology, including feels like artificial intelligence. And uh, I would imagine that those fields are not the first one that people think of when they think about Brown versus Board of Education and the civil rights movement. And so I wanna ask you, what led you down that particular research path? Um, I have, I'm, I'm very blessed to have friends who do amazing things. <laughs> and uh, I think, who did I reach out to? I'm not sure. I think that I was getting in touch with a dear friend, Meredith Whitaker, um, and I'll use the book to help me describe her uh, in, a, in a more like succinct and not like meandering, like completely in love with her type of way. But Meredith is a research professor at New York University, a co-founder and co-director of the AI Now Institute, the Artificial Intelligence Now Institute, and the founder of Google's Open Research Group. Um, she co-founded MLab, a globally distributed network measurement system that provides the world's largest source of open data on internet performance. Her work focuses on the social implications of artificial intelligence and the tech industry responsible for it. As a longtime tech worker, she helped lead labor organizing efforts at Google, driven by the belief that worker power and collective action are necessary to ensure meaningful tech accountability. Meredith reminds us that the code and algorithms that govern tech products are not neutral. 
they too reflect and amplify our deeply racist, ableist, sexist, and capitalist social systems and histories. Technology and its design, um, technology as it's designed and sold under racial capitalism is too often used as a tool to further consolidate power and control. But Whitaker also points to recent acts of resistance from the LAUSD teacher strike, that's Los Angeles uh, United by School District teacher strike, and youth organizing to her and uh, Rashida Richardson's then work at AI Now Institute, uh, where they are seeing, they were seeing uh, organizers demand more ethical uses of tech in schools and beyond. So I was talking with Meredith about this project, and she told me the person I needed to talk to was Rashida Richardson, um, who uh, Rashida was then the director of policy research at AI Now Institute, an, inter an interdisciplinary research institute based at NYU, focused on social implica implications of artificial intelligence. So prior to her work at AI Now Institute, she was legislative counsel at the New York Civil Liberties Union, mm -hmm. where she led the organizing, organization's work on privacy, technology, surveillance, and education issues. Um, so uh, we started with Rashida and then came to uh, Meredith, and eventually, our final, the final conversation and the arc of all of the conversations in the book is with Sabelo Sethu, Sethu, Sethu Umlambi, who is a computer scientist and researcher whose work focuses on the intersection of ethics, technology, and human rights. Um, and at the time, he was here at Harvard at the Kennedy School and the Berkman Center. So um, these are the people that opened up for us the link between ethics, human rights, and education. Um, and technology. Rashida told us about a case that she worked on and research that she was doing at AI Now Then about loopholes for um, funding for technology upgrades that, that were being used by a particular school district in upstate New York to, instead of buying laptops and iPads and uh, webcams and stuff like that, that, that money was being used uh, to purchase uh, um, facial recognition surveillance equipment um, for the school unbeknownst to the parents and unbeknownst to the community. And that, uh, that software was deeply embedded with very racialized algorithms, uh, I shouldn't say racialized, very racist algorithms. So the, the children of color were the minority in this community, but in, this, in the code that was governing that, uh, that software that they were uh, buying, um, they were hyper criminalized. They were yeah. presumed they were uh, they were more likely to be targeted uh, and presumed to have done something wrong um, by uh, and then and then handed over to police inside of their schools. Yeah. Um, even even though the actual data about crime uh, youth crime uh, showed otherwise. So um, yeah. that kind of opened the door for us. Right. So, so it's really um, a point about the continuum of inequality and the changing um, architecture, you might say, of inequality. Um, we need to transition to audience questions in just a minute, Tamashi. But first, I want to give everyone a chance to see some of the stunning images from the Brown 2 exhibition. Uh, and we're going to do that through a brief slideshow. You know, for me, so much of this, like when I finally got to make these works on paper, was uh, just getting to enjoy coming into the studio every day and every night. I would work until like, I don't know, early afternoon until one o'clock in the morning. And just being awash in these images of these heroes, you know, just 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 getting more acquainted with Polly Murray and Ruth Batson, um, however late in life this may be for me, and hoping that as a curricular referent, you know, this, this collection can be used. And this is what my question is for you. I know I'm breaking a rule right now, but um, uh, oh, as a curricular referent, hoping that, um, that, uh, that there won't be another generation who doesn't learn about who these people are until they're in their thirties when they happen to be <laughs> in grad school with access to a law library, you know, um, or have a best friend who knows that history. You know, we should all, it should all be common knowledge. Mm. Um, 
So before we transition, I just want to jump in and go to my uh, go to this page, page 32 in the book for those of you who have it. Um, it's from my interview, our interview with Dean Brown Nagan. Um, so I asked you then, Dean Brown Nagan, um, uh, we wanted you to share your thoughts about the backlash to Brown versus the Board of Education one and two and the historic precedent of rapid, sudden, and brutal closure of schools in, in the United States. What understanding can be gained by fully acknowledging this history and those directly impacted by it when considering the current global health, uh, public health crisis, the subsequent closure of uh, school campuses, and the mass displacement of an entire generation of students? Um, and what precipitated that question for Dean Brown Nagan was a quote from uh, the 2004 report Beyond Brown v. Board, The Final Battle for Excellence in American Education uh, by Ellis Close, in which they describe, after the Supreme Court ordered desegregation with all deliberate speed, Prince Edward officials swore to use every legal honorable means to continue the, the high type of education we proposed to give to children of both races in Prince Edward County. Following the precedent set in Clarendon County, a three judge federal panel approved a delay in the implementation of desegregation. When delay was no longer an option, Prince Edward County closed its public schools altogether. So that was another like big uh, awakening when we were doing this, that there is a huge precedent to the, because people were saying like, oh, schools have never been closed like this before. Mm -hmm. uh, this has never happened in American history. And we were like, well, there it is but it happened to black children. <laughs> so Tamashi, I don't recall precisely what I said then. I will say <laughs> now that um, all of that knowledge is empowering. And I, I salute you for all that you're doing through art to engage people around um, that history. And now I want to turn oh. to some audience questions. And one of them is about how you balance work in the studio and work in the archive. Does one come before another? Um, well, um, I guess it depends on the project. It depends on the circumstances. So mm -hmm. our circumstances with this project um, changed our relationship to uh, digging into the archive. Um, sometimes when I was in Georgia and I had and I'd been asked to come there to make work and I had never been there before, I drove around with my host and observed with my eyes and with my whole body what the experience of transportation was there. And and people that I was introduced to talk to me about the difficulty of transportation in Georgia uh, or you know, around the Atlanta area. And um, yeah, I don't know, it just depends. I mean, you know, ideally I would have access to my studio, which is in, in Brooklyn, New York. I would, I would normally be there more, um, but uh, yeah, I gotta say it depends on the project. Yeah. Okay, great. So we have a lot of questions and I want to try oh, we do? <laughs> to run through all of them. Yes. Um, there's a question about what's next for you with these works and the publication. Do you see opportunities to incorporate uh, them into a curriculum? Um, sure. I mean, I, uh, one of my fantasies while we were uh, working on this uh was uh you know or i guess not it's not so much a fantasy but um trying to re remain open to all that could come of what we were discovering together and one of them was to um find ways to be in partnership with people who are actively facilitating in boston public schools and independent schools um the radcliffe institute has a whole bunch of community partnerships already we have friends at the ICA. Um, Ruth Erickson is a curator there, and they have an amazing uh, youth uh, youth um, department. Uh, when I was teaching at MassArt, a number of my students uh, also worked at the ICA to facilitate workshops and stuff like that. Um, there's a, a small group called um, 
It's there the the Black Feminist Praxis Circle, um, uh, just a small a small group of like twelve Black women who gather in in Boston to study and to read together. So I, I, and then there's also oh the the Children's Muse Museum of the Arts New York, that's led by um, uh, um, my friend Seth. <laughs> um, and uh, so like I I I, I would love for uh, uh, the the Children's Museum has this. Uh, web of um, this 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 web all over the boroughs of New York City uh, of families that they've been sending art supplies to. Um, uh, Seth Cameron, I'm sorry, I just said Seth, but that that they've been sending art supplies to during the lockdown. So something else that Seth Cameron and I were talking about was getting copies of the book to the Children's Museum so that they could go out um, to uh, children's families. Uh, they could be used as educational tools for people who are learning, um, who are doing distance learning, and for all of us. I mean, for for any of us who are who are who can who are interested in reading or reading to others. Um, Martha and I also really wanted to make a, a coloring book, um, uh, working with uh, Professor David J. Harris, who really, David David Harris was really um, the person who inspired us to keep going. Um, we met with him the day that we went into lockdown. Uh, we were all supposed to meet together socially distanced and things were just so weird. I just asked everyone to stay where they were. Um, and he talked with us for something like two and a half hours. And it wasn't until hour, hour two that it occurred to me that we should be recording. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, we realized that we could continue to have these conversations. We could answer gaping holes in existing archives about these narratives and animate them in a way that makes them accessible afresh now. So um, heck yeah. I mean, the Meg is really, really kind and generous. Any educators who are listening and who wanna get a hold of this material as pedagogical um, uh, source material, we're down, we're totally down for it. Excellent to know. And Tamashi, there's a question about whether uh, this kind of publication, which you've held up uh, a number of times is a new art form that will accompany other works that you create? Um, I don't think it's new. Um, you know, it's occurred to me, it occurred to me because I've been uh, um, asked to talk so much lately. It, it, um, when we were doing this work, uh, no, actually when I was, I offered this methodology to the Parish Museum as a way for us to continue doing that work toward my show there called The Land Claim. When I realized that I could continue to have conversations with people on Long Island, via Zoom and I could work with my team to transcribe those conversations and add that to the forthcoming publication. Um, and while we were working on that, I realized that this is the way my thesis, my MIT thesis was written um, for the School of Architecture and Planning. I, I had conversations with my mother over Skype with really, really bad tech. <laughs> and Nia um, would listen and transcribe for me and those conversations about my family's uh, relationship to informal labor, inspired by a class I took at the Kennedy School, Dean Nagan, mm -hmm. um, Dean Brown Nagan, a, a class that I took with um, Martha Alter Chen, Marty Chen, mm -hmm. um, on informal economies, uh, made me uh, realize that uh, that social, socio-economic driven data, research data, could open up areas of understanding for me about my own relatives, my family's relationship to labor that they had never been able to say themselves due to the trauma associated with that labor. So my mother was the oldest child of my grandmothers who went to work with my elders. So she was the one who had the stories about going into people's homes and cleaning homes and taking care of their children or my aunt making food for monks in uh, Laurel Canyon in Los Angeles. Mm. So we transcribed portions of those conversations and they inspired projects that became the chapters of my thesis. Um, but then recently while talking with the Brooklyn Rail um, or preparing for a talk with the Brooklyn Rail, I realized that this methodology was also burgeoning when I was an undergrad at Cooper Union um, and making work about waste management and uh, Belize. So I don't think it's new, but it's definitely maturing and I'm super excited by the kind of sharing that's possible um, with a focused intention on producing a thorough publication. Um, because eventually an exhibition will travel or it will close, 
um, it's ephemeral, it's experiential, but the publication allows it to continue to move around and do its work. Wow, indeed it does. Um, <laughs> Tawashi, there's a question about the medium of your artwork. What is it? Oh, <laughs> I mean, you know, it depends on the project. <laughs> it depends on the project. Sometimes it's video, sometimes it's fiber work. Um, uh, when I uh, uh, went to New Haven for graduate school for painting and printmaking, I was really, um, I became really fixated on creating an ecosystem. Um, there were aha moments that I had around um, fiber work, because while I was here in Cambridge, the two years after, my, after I graduated from MIT, I was taking care of children uh, around here. Um, they would actually come to this building and they would make art in my apartment and I would knit. I started knitting to keep my head and my neck warm while I waited for them in the snow to pick them up from their school buses. And as soon as I started knitting, I started wondering if the knitted works were paintings and I started thinking about their color interactivity. And I took those with me when I had a, when I got a studio at Yale and um, started using them to uh, merge my friends into the paintings that I was making. And then, the, but the only way to really make that merger complete was to take that image into a video space, use the chroma key to pull colors out and drop information in. Um, and then that created another output. Um, and then I learned that, um, then I learned that I could take stills from those video collages and make C prints which was like, it really blew my mind because I was like, oh, then at that point I have another tangible outcome merging all of these worlds of materiality that in this world are independent. The painting, the person, the fiber work, mm. the research, they actually merge in the video space and become tangible again as photographs. Um, so yeah, it depends. <laughs> um, I, I, I painted murals for many years in Los Angeles and in uh, Northern California. I, you know, I really uh, was pulled into the world of valuing public art um, by my mentors in the San Francisco Bay Area. So um, I'm just as happy on a scaffolding as I am uh, as I am uh, in a studio or in a library. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Tamashi, there is a, a question from a colleague at Yale who asks if you think that your own learning path, which has been so varied and experiential, presents a new model for more integrative educational goals. Yeah, I don't know if, I, I just don't know if it's new, but uh, you know, I mean, this is, this is why this area of research, Dean Brown-Nagin, I'm going back to your interview um, because this, I'm going to answer this question by getting back to this quote, and I'm not going to look at Dean Brown Nagin right now. <laughs> well, okay. So what I was reading to you before continues uh, as uh, Prince Edward County closed its public schools altogether from fall 1959 through much of 1964 the schools were shuttered quote we underestimated the resolve of the white population of Prince Edward County. No one ever thought that they would rather close the schools and no one ever thought that the United States of America would let it go on so long, observed John Stokes. If you were white, that was not necessarily a tragedy. Those whose parents had a little money could go to the Prince Edward Academy, the newly established private school, but blacks who were barred from the state subsidized segregation academies were not so fortunate. Most saw their education hopes wither until so-called free schools were finally opened in fall of 1963. The lucky ones managed to go to school elsewhere Many were helped by the American Friends Service Committee, which set up the emergency student placement program in 1960 to send students out of the county to get an education. Some parents developed their own ad hoc relocation plans. Benita Foster was preparing to enter the fourth grade when the schools were shut down. Quote, most of my friends did not go anywhere. They languished in Farmville. When schools finally opened, they were so far behind that college seemed an unattainable dream. They did not think they could do the work, recalled Foster. I think that we lost a lot of the doctors we could have had, a lot of teachers who could have helped. I think that it had an impact on their children and in some cases, their grandchildren. 
Um, I feel like I'm just a product, I'm a beneficiary of this history um, mm -hmm. because I went to public magnet school for performing in visual arts and I have experienced encouragement around the things that I'm good at um, since I was very little. So um, even when I ran into areas that were not encouraging or people that didn't understand me, um, uh, seeds were already being planted uh, that respected me um, as, as an artist. Yeah. Like, you know, that changes everything. Um, I, I learned about Cooper Union when I was in high school, a public arts high school in Los Angeles, LA County High School for the Arts. At Cooper Union, I learned about what was happening at MIT and Yale. Um, I also spent time at the San Francisco Art Institute, which recently closed. So I just want to say that it's 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 important for us to see ourselves as implicated parties and also responsible stewards for education opportunities for every not just ourselves but everyone else around us. That's a great answer, uh, Tamashi. It is to say that you, as am I, are standing on the shoulders of Bali Murray and Ruth Batson, which is uh, just a, a wonderful way of connecting your uh, artistic production to that history. So we have time for one more question. And I am going to ask you, um, there's a person here who is really complimenting your, your openness. Uh, during the talk, she says, or he says, it's one of the most incredible talks he has ever, or she has ever attended. Um, and the question is whether you feel like your openness and your warmth comes naturally, or is it more um, a move between, uh, is it more conscious and practice and, and a product of training? Um, I think I am, I think I'm just, I think I'm just this way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, from what my mother used to tell me, um, yeah, I think, I think I'm, this is, this is just the way that I am. And I'm, uh, I've, I'm learning, I've learned and I'm continuing to learn how to, um, accept myself. Mm, well, we are so happy that you are this <laughs> way, Tamashi. Uh, and, and I'm afraid that we are out of time. I, I want to thank you. I know it went so fast. I want to thank you uh, for being a part of this conversation. I want to thank the audience for joining us and for all of the excellent questions. And I also want to conclude by saying, I hope you'll visit the Brown 2 exhibition at Radcliffe in our Johnson Kulikundas Family Gallery. You can visit our website for information about how to register in advance for your visit. Thank you and have a good evening. <laughs>